My name is Daniel Benjamin. I'm the president of the American Academy in Berlin, and I want to welcome you to the Daimler Foreign Policy Forum discussion of Merkel's legacy, featuring Kati Martin and Ambassador Wolfgang Ischinger. This, I'm delighted to say, is a kind of family reunion at the Academy, since both Kati Martin and Wolfgang Ischinger's are long, Ischinger are longtime trustees of the Academy. Our Daimler Foreign Policy Forum is made possible through the generous donations of the Daimler Fonds im Stifterverband für die Deutsche Wissenschaft. Now, uh, former uh, lecturers in this series include Ambassador Bill Burns, now director of the CIA, historian John Connolly, political scientist Lynn Vavrek, and now tonight we add to this list Kati Martin. Uh, is to, is Eckhart here? I haven't seen. Ah, oh, Eckhart, there. I didn't recognize you with a mask on. Um, we're especially delighted to welcome Eckhart von Clayden, Vice President and Head of External Affairs of Daimler AG, whose support has made it possible for us to host tonight's presentation. Now, as all students of government know, there are strong presidential systems, such as France's, where the president has expansive powers, and then weaker ones, such as our own in the United States. I think the American Academy can be said to be somewhere to the left of the American system itself, since although I am president of the Academy, I am barred from even introducing our principal speaker. However, I do get to introduce the introducer. Let me just uh, begin by saying somewhat illicitly here that I am delighted we are holding this event to discuss Kati Martin's superb new book, The Chancellor, The Remarkable Odyssey of Angela Merkel, which, if I can probably steal a headline from Wolfgang, um, I should note has just been named one of the 100 best books of 2021 by the New York Times. Uh, it's a fascinating portrait of the West's most durable leader, more than 16 years and counting. And if the coalition partners don't do their work quickly, she will be the longest serving German uh, chancellor in history. Um, she is a woman who has managed some of the most vexing and tangled crises of the 21st century, and she has widely been given credit for holding together the Western Alliance through the traumatic events of 27 through 2021. Uh, what I especially like about the book is the insights it gives into um, what succeeds in ruling a large democracy, and in particular this large democracy, Germany, and what does not. In that respect, it's a little bit like a prince for 2021. But let me not tarry from my true task, which is to introduce Wolfgang Ischinger, who will be moderating tonight. Wolfgang is not only Germany's most renowned diplomat, but one of the most accomplished ones anywhere in our era. In addition to the pinnacle achievement of being a member of the Board of Trustees at the American Academy in Berlin, he has served as the chairman of the Munich Security Conference since 2008 and built that into an extraordinary organization. Wolfgang has had a distinguished academic record that included a year of high school in Watseka, Illinois, not far from the Indiana border. Later on, he studied law in Bonn and Geneva, as well as international law and economics and history at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and he also studied diplomacy itself at Harvard Law School. He has had more impressive positions in uh, the German Foreign Service than one can easily recite. Uh, among others, he has been the director of the policy planning staff and political director. He led the German delegation during the Bosnian peace negotiations in Dayton, as well as being involved in negotiations on the NATO-Russian Founding Act and the Kosovo Crisis. He was appointed state secretary in 1998 and served as German ambassador in Washington from 2001 to 2006, not the easiest years, uh, and in London from 2006 to 2008. He is a senior Professor for Security Policy and Diplomatic Practice at the Hertie School of Governance here in Berlin, Honorary Professor at the University of Tübingen, and the holder of many honors, including the Bundesverdienstkreuz, Commander of the Legion d'Honneur, and many others. He is a ter terrific trustee, and he is an ideal interlocutor for, uh, for tonight's uh, discussion, since he has known Angela Merkel for many, many years. Before I turn the podium over to Wolfgang, let me just say a few words about the structure of the evening. Um, he will uh, perform the honors of introducing our speaker, 
They will uh, have a conversation for about 40 minutes, and that will be followed by question and answer. Uh, if you're here, I guess you know the routine regarding uh, how to ask a question. If you're joining by Zoom, uh, do not raise your hand or type in the chat uh, section, but instead uh, please put your question in the Q&A part of the Zoom screen. Uh, Wolfgang will be able to see the submitted questions. He will read them aloud for Kati, and we apologize in advance should um, we not get to all of the questions, which I'm guessing we won't do. So with that, Herr Botschafter. Here's the book. <laughs> and it's for sale. <laughs> Not this copy. <laughs> so I've already scribbled in it. Um, does it work? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, Good evening. Good evening to everybody. Uh, I'm so, so glad we can actually do events like this, and I hope we can keep doing events like this at the Academy, even as pandemic numbers continue to rise throughout the, throughout the country. Um, of course, uh, you took away my opening sentence, um, uh, Dan. Uh, but thank you for this uh, very, very nice introduction. I remember an event which someone did for Henry Kissinger so many years ago uh, with a long you know, list of accomplishments by Dr. Kissinger. And when he finally was invited to take the floor and to say something, he said, uh, you know, I wish you could have gone on and on and on. And if my mother had been here, she would have believed it all. <clears throat> Something like that. So I, I enjoyed uh, listening to you about all the <laughs> stuff that, that has happened. Quite frankly, before we turn to Kati and the book and Angela Merkel, I, I want to make a remark which is indirectly very much linked mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. Kati and to the book and indirectly also to Angela Merkel because mm -hmm. 26 years ago yesterday, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm was the final negotiating day, the conclusion of the negotiations, 21 November yes. in uh, Dayton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And you were there, mm -hmm. and uh, of course our founder here, Dick Holbrook, actually made it all happen. Mm -hmm. uh, books mm -hmm. have been written about that, and I, this is not the moment to go through that, but I wanted to just mm -hmm. uh, say this. Mm -hmm. If, we, if our governments, including the incoming German government and including the Biden administration and others are now not paying attention, mm. the, the legacy of the Dayton Accords, which brought peace to a country savaged by war, the legacy may uh, end uh, and, and, and may, may go up in, in flames. Uh, Mr. Mm. Dodig knows what he's doing yep. um, in the uh, Bosnian Serb Republic, and my impression is that no one pays sufficient attention to that. So this is why I mention it, and I hope somebody listens either mm. by video mm. Uh, mm. And, mm. and brings this to the attention of those in the government here in Berlin, in Brussels, in Paris, in Washington, elsewhere. Uh, we must not have another bloody confrontation in the Balkans. Actually, we owe that to Richard Holbrook. Mm, thank Full you. stop. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. If I, if I can just jump in uh, and, and say that uh, I really appreciate you uh, noting that, uh, that historic anniversary. And, um, and I wouldn't be here. None of us would be here, actually, uh, if it were not for, for Richard, the founder, as you mentioned, of this academy. And Richard had had two sources of great pride. One was peace in Bosnia, and the other was the American Academy. And and so to bring those two uh, those two achievements, which he really considered his 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 legacy, uh, together uh, on the same platform. And and another thing I owe uh, Richard is 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 your friendship, Wolfgang. Because we, we, we met during those incredibly intense days at Dayton, 
and where we all uh, lived in, in army barracks, shared, shared the same terrible food, and, and rubbed uh, shoulders, elbows, other things with, with some of the worst uh, war criminals in the world. All in all, in uh, the cause of peace, and uh, and when things hit a wall for Richard, he would um, he would ask me to take um, Milosevic for a walk in the beautiful parking lot, and and he would ask me to play amateur uh, a diplomat, and Kati make him talk about what he has in mind for his grandchildren's future. Good luck with that. I tried my best, but actually none of them, not Milosevic, not Izbegovic, not Siladic, and certainly not Tujman. This was our glorious cast of characters. They were not interested in their grandchildren's future. They were interested in only one thing, and that was to hold on to power. That was a real lesson in realpolitik for, for me, the innocent. Uh, new, new, freshly minted diplomat. So I just wanted to say <laughs> that's a digression, but but not really, um, because because of course we're here to talk about power and its exercise and about someone who uh, who has mastered the art of not only attaining power but holding on to power. So back to you, Ambassador. Thank you, uh, Kati. Uh, one of the 100 best books as as uh, presented by the New York Times. When was that, yesterday or today. earlier today. today? So congratulations Thank to you, you Kati. So, so you. Uh, congratulations to all of you because you are at the right moment here tonight. <laughs> this is not uh, time wrongly invested uh, to uh, talk about a book about a person that has, uh, that deserves to be scrutinized to be honored and uh, uh, and whose legacy will accompany us for, for many, many, many years to come. Obviously, uh, Kati Martin knows how to write a book. Before this, uh, she has written nine others. Uh, I remember reading her book. This was about a decade ago. Mm. Um, I noted the, the, uh, the title enemies of the people about her own family, my family's journey to America, mm -hmm. published uh, around 2009 or mm -hmm. so. Um, and Kati, of course, has been a correspondent, a journalist herself for many years, working in America, working, to, uh, uh, working also here in Europe. Um, and uh, as has already been said, longtime trustee of this academy, which was founded by Richard Holbrook with this far-sighted idea that when you knew way back in the early 90s that there would be an end to hundreds of thousands of American soldiers mm. who would at some point return to their home country and be quote-unquote unofficial ambassadors of Germany in Kentucky or in Tennessee or in mm. Texas or so, and that this would end uh, because of the numbers of American soldiers going down. So how can America maintain a presence and a relationship um, going beyond official dom? And out of that grew this idea and I want to congratulate you, Dan, and, and, and our board, and, uh, and especially you, Kati, because uh, you. uh, you've done a lot for, for the Academy. Now, to the book. Yes. And uh, I want, of course, I'm going to shut up in a moment. I'm here only to moderate uh, whatever questions you and, and those who are participating in this by video, uh, questions or comments that you may wish to address to, uh, to Kati. But let me just uh, mention a couple of points which uh, I retain from, uh, from uh, reading the book and which again have to do with, uh, with, with the legacy of this academy and, and the role of Richard Holbrook. Uh, a, an American friend of mine, lady friend of mine, recently suggested, just a couple of weeks ago, 
that the time may have come for America to no longer consider itself a European power. Mm. And this brings to mind mm. that in the mid-90s, uh, the former ambassador to Germany, Richard Holbrook, published a, an article mm. in Foreign Affairs, which was titled, America as a European Power. Uh, I think that my entire generation mm. of German advisors and policymakers um, found that extremely reassuring, this idea that America was not only here for a moment, mm. but actually for good, and would uh, stay with us. Uh, not necessarily always in the same role, but would stay with us. Now there, is, uh, there are doubts. Uh, about the longer term future. And it is even uh, more important for that reason if we are not so sure whether Pax Americana will continue to govern us on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, it's even more important that we have reliable leadership on both sides of the Atlantic. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about um, Angela Merkel. And Finally, before turning uh, to you, Kati, uh, my very first moment of, uh, of saying wow about Angela Merkel was actually at some point, I forget, maybe it was 96 or 97, during the last couple of years of Helmut Kohl, when the Bertelsmann Foundation had organized an event in Berlin where this woman, Angela Merkel, who was a junior minister in mm -hmm. the German government, and I actually, as a foreign policy person, I had never really developed any interest in who she was, what, what role she played, etc. And she was invited for some reason to come and speak to this crowd of people, including Henry Kissinger, who was mm -hmm. actually sitting right next to me in the, among the people watching the proceedings. Uh, she was invited to speak about Russia. And I've been, as a, you know, I served for a bit many years ago as a, as, for a while as a speechwriter for the then German foreign minister. I've always had this arrogance of people who don't like people who simply read speeches prepared by speechwriters. Especially when you know that they don't really know what they're reading. In the case of Angela Merkel, whom I had never heard of really, speaking about Russia, mm. I had a kind of a wow moment because she spoke without notes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she had something to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she spoke for about 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, and what she said made a lot of sense to mm -hmm, me. Mm -hmm. She up, apparently had, things, had thought things through to mm -hmm. some kind of end. Mm -hmm. And I remember, and I'm, I'm sure he would, uh, he would not uh, uh, be disappointed uh, uh, if I tell this uh, here in this in, in the academy, which has been Henry Kissinger's second home here in Berlin, at the end of her presentation, he turned to me and said, do you think I should go and meet with her? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which mm -hmm. is, I think, what he then did. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I don't know how many hundreds of meetings followed, uh, uh, followed that. So that was when I first noticed that there was somebody here mm -hmm. with a very keen intelligence mm -hmm. and with the knowledge about the area that I thought I was competent about, in, in this case, foreign policy and Russia. And wow, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. did she have something to say? Well, this is... this is this, So let yeah. me turn it over yeah. now to Kati. And I don't Thank know you. whether you want to read a, a, a passage from the book or just talk about what motivated yeah. you and what you found so attractive about this personality that you decided to devote, I don't yeah. know how many months of your life to this. Uh, countless, countless. Uh, five years. 
Um, so, Wolfgang, thank you. Um, you have um, very artfully just um, uh, nailed um, Angela Merkel's superpower, which is that she has a photographic memory and she is always prepared. So you and I have, have observed great negotiators, uh, you among them. I, I had that opportunity in Dayton. Um, and, and Holbrook's superpowers were, were, were charm, threats, and, and a strategic vision of where he wanted things to come out. Um, Merkel's superpower is that she has a, a granular familiarity with issues that cannot be matched at the negotiating table. Plus, she has stamina that outlasts um, a man half her age. They drop like flies and she is still at the table. In Minsk, for example, just to, just to uh, jump in uh, to uh, one of her finest uh, achievements as a negotiator, which, uh, which was to, to, to halt the Russian aggression in, in Ukraine through diplomacy, not arms, because for her, uh, the use of, of, of arms, of um, the deployment of, of military, is, is a sign of the failure of the policymakers and of diplomacy. So she will, she will stay until, um, uh, the last, until her last breath to prevent that. So in, in Minsk, she said that she only knew the time of day by whether uh, bread and jam or a roast were being served. So that level of focus, um, which I trace back to her scientific uh, training, because she was, as you know, a physicist, um, and she is very comfortable dealing with details, with figures, with charts, uh, which I have never encountered uh, in any uh, politician, and they tend to be mostly male. Um, in addition to that, um, she has um, uh, another superpower, which is that hers is a brand of leadership that is ego-free. That is to say that she is not involved in, in, personally involved in the outcome. She parks her ego, and it's all about getting results. And again, I've never encountered that. And I, I, I would, um, I would urge you. You compared this this book earlier to to um, to the prince, Machiavelli's The Prince, or let's call it the princess in her case. And and indeed, there are so many lessons in this book and in her legacy and in her career for for future leaders. And I don't just mean politicians. Any men and women interested in, in, in gaining leadership and, and holding on to leadership. Um, I would urge to read this book because her, her uh, life story is, uh, is so full of examples of how much you can get done if your ego isn't involved, if it isn't about cr taking credit for things. It's remarkable. It, you know, the lesson seems so obvious, and yet so few can um, can achieve what she has achieved. Because, because so uh, you know, I, I don't want to sound totally sexist, but but most of our politicians and leaders tend to be men, and their egos are always on the line. And she had the particular misfortune of of dealing with with some of the worst demagogues that we've had in recent decades. Um, so, you know, obviously uh, uh, Putin, who was her longest dysfunctional marriage, and she is still in that marriage because, because even today she is talking to Putin. Um, uh, she's the, the only one whose, whose calls he really takes uh, about Lukashenko's uh, aggression. Uh, on the Polish border. She is the one who's making that call. But then she, she also had Erdogan and Orban, and let's not forget Donald Trump. And, <laughs> and, and they never got under her skin because she doesn't personalize politics the way almost all politicians do. Uh, for her, it's about getting results and not about ego 
satisfaction. Now you asked uh, what what attracted me to this to this project. First of all, Wolfgang, I had no idea how tough it would be. It turned out to be it's my tenth book and by far the toughest because this is the most private public person in the world. She did not want this or any other book written about her, but that is not a reason not to write a book about a singular historic figure. Um, not only because she's Germany's first woman chancellor, but because she has given us a new template for leadership. I first became really uh, interested in her uh, in 2015, when she allowed one million um, mostly Middle Eastern uh, refugees to enter Germany. And at a time when, uh, when all other um, Europeans were, were erecting walls, barricades, unspooling barbed wire. Um, and I, she, she very calmly in her, in her typical uh, low key, let's diffuse the drama way, said, wir schaffen das. And indeed she schaffened it. And, and Germany did. And it was, uh, it was, it, it changed the world's perception of Germany. I think it changed Germany, Germans' own perception of their, of their uh, capacity for humanitarian um, intervention. And it's, as, as you all know better than me, uh, coming in from New York, um, <clears throat> it's no longer the, 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 the refugee situation is a back burner issue. It's not a hot topic. There are many other topics that, that preempt that. So... So she, she uh, uh, showed the world that there is a way um, uh, to, to deal with what is the greatest humanitarian crisis and challenge of our time, along with climate change, is, is migration. And there is, there is now um, a template. But of course, I had no idea that, that to write the sort of book that I was interested in writing, which was not the minute gathering of, of uh, information about the Bundestag's uh, every decision. I think even Germans are bored by that. And, and certainly I was, I was writing for a... Um, uh, an, uh, a global audience, not specifically a German one. Um, my my purpose was to capture the human story, um, and and that that um, turned out to be challenging, but but not impossible. Let me push you a little bit on the 2015 yeah. decision. Um, I think there are polling data around in this country mm -hmm. and around Europe that seem to indicate that uh, views are quite divided. Mm -hmm. uh, I've met people, and many, I'm sure many in the room here have met people who argue uh, her decision single-handedly um, accelerated the victory of the peace party in Poland. There are people who, who have argued, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that I agree yeah. with that, but these are important arguments that have been, been thrown around. Uh, there are people who, who have argued uh, the Brexit decision uh, might not have uh, gone uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the way it did in 2016 if this had not happened half a year earlier. Um, in fact, a French friend of mine, who many of you in the room here know, uh, personally, uh, uh, argued at the time in late 2015 that uh, he was afraid that the uh, uh, that Madame Le Pen's party yes. would uh, uh, would get so much um, support yeah. uh, uh, in the process of digesting these events uh, that maybe Macron would not would not win the elections in 20, uh, right. a year later. So how do you, I mean, you, you look at this not from a German position, but from an American position, uh, uh, but you have dealt with the person and with these events mm. so intimately for such a long time. Share with I, us your view. Okay, first of all, this is not an uncritical, uh, this is not by any means a hagiography. Um, I, um, 
I deal with her blind spots. She is, after all, human. She has blind spots, and, and I'd like to get into those blind spots. But to answer um, your question about the refugee decision, I think it was a, um, a very brave one. It was probably um, the, the one that seals her, her historic legacy, um, given Germany's uh, own uh, ex very dark um, history. This, this, this was transformative, um, and Germany is now considered the more, not only the, the, um, the economic and financial center of Europe, but the moral center. And that is <laughs> beyond, uh, beyond estimation, an enormous uh, transformation of, of Germany and something that Germans should be, should be very proud of. The, the world looks now to Germany for, for moral leadership. Now, of course, um, it had consequences, and, and one of them is the presence in the Bundestag of the Alternative für Deutschland. Um, that, too, is a child of the Merkel era. And um, she was a little bit, um, because she's such a hyper-rational person, again, the training in science as her formation, uh, she underestimates the role of the irrational in human decision-making. And she underestimated the, uh, um, her, her own region, East Germany, her own region's um, reluctance to go along with her policy of, um, of Willkommenskultur. She didn't spend enough time because she's a terrible speaker. She's not a gifted, uh, she's not gifted in rhetoric. That is among her um, deficiencies. She didn't spend enough time explaining to her fellow East Germans that, that in fact, given Germany's demographic um, future, it needed an infusion of, uh, of, of, of new young uh, 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 population. And, and in fact, I, I've spent a lot of time with, with, with uh, refugees who arrived at that period. I've, I've followed them around you know, in schools and places of work. Germany really stepped up, uh, having learned its lesson for, uh, from the, from the um, very weak assimilation of the Turkish Gastarbeiter. Um, it really learned, uh, learned its lesson and, and uh, mobilized. Um, schools um, took in and, and in, ensured that, that um, language training was mandatory. Everybody has to learn German. Um, and, and you have this work training program, which is the envy of the world, um, w w wherein um, the, the, the terrorism um, uh, from refugees is, is minuscule. There's far more terrorist terrorism from the far right than, than from the refugees. But, but um, it, was, it was not, nothing in life, Wolfgang, is cost free. <laughs> and and of course um, we can we can say that that she gave populists uh, a shot in the arm, but um, I, I I I tend to blame other factors on the on the rise of populism, and I would uh, I give her great credit for uh, for for this humanitarianism and and the, and and the, and the fact that one million people who didn't have a future now have a, have a future. I, I think that's, uh, that's an incredible achievement. And her, her, her brand of, of uh, moderation and, and tolerance um, it may, not, may not have a long future, but it, it, uh, it, it has established deep roots here in, in Germany. And I, I, I just hope and pray that, uh, that, it's, uh, that her successors uh, are able to sustain it. Um, I want to remind you that in a, in a few minutes we will turn to your questions. Mm -hmm. And I would also encourage uh, those who are watching this from afar. Uh, I'm going to be given a tablet uh, mm -hmm. in a few minutes with questions that have come in from, from those not here in the room. Yeah. So we'll open this up in a few minutes. But let me, let me change the subject for, for just for one more moment. Uh, among us here is, is Eki von Kleden, who, who worked in the Chancellery with 
Angela Merkel for I don't know how many years was it, Eki? At least in the chancery, four years. Mm -hmm. Four years, mm -hmm. yeah. But you were you were in her uh, fraction uh, and in, in important f functions for far more than just these four years. So the interesting thing, and it it's, it does come out in in your book, is when I think of my own time in Washington mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as a foreign ambassador, it was I had a great time because it was very easy to find somebody who would tell you what happened in the White House yesterday right. and was actually the National Security Council uh, deputy uh, head mm -hmm. uh, on the other side of the argument presented by the Defense Department. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and the media, the journalists, were, of course, busy writing all day about these intramural fights yeah. going on in the, inside the administration with a great deal of transparency created. What was the Defense Department thinking? What was the State Department thinking? Mm -hmm. What is the President thinking? And why is he, is, is he not supporting on this particular uh, issue his own national security advisor? All of this not known in this town. <laughs> Nothing has ever come out right. of internal yeah. discussions with you and others uh, uh -huh. present. Not... I. Is that, me, a, is, that a bad, is that a bad no, thing? No, that is my question. Okay. Is this good or bad? Uh, is, I, I would what, say. What, is, what, is, uh, what, kind of, yeah. what kind of degree of transparency and understanding yeah. do we, the public, want to have in order to understand and support yeah. the decision-making process? Yeah. I think there are really two extremes here. The American process, which is wide open. I, of course, I also served in London later there was a slightly less open mm -hmm. uh, uh, discussion mm. um, and this very, very close chop with, and I think it was particularly close during the 16 Merkel years, because in the Schroeder period and to some extent even in the Helmut Kohl era, you did get the occasional uh, disagreement, uh, uh, information about disagreement among, among certain office holders within the chancellery or at least within the government. So, uh, uh, what's yeah. your take on that? Is it uh, her? Is it her desire to keep things well, under wraps, or what? Well, let's not forget that, um, in addition to her background in science, the the the, 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 the her, her foundation was as a uh, citizen of the Stasi state, the ultimate surveillance state, which means that she grew up trusting very few people with good reason. She was under surveillance. And, and therefore, um, this, this, this suspicious nature of hers was transferred uh, to the chancellery. And uh, when, when, for example, Barack Obama came to say goodbye to her in 2016, he looked around uh, the, her office and and saw that it was the same four people as as uh, came in with her um, eight years before when he started his presidency and said you guys all still here because of course uh, that would never happen in any White House which has a total revolving door uh, uh, and, and staff uh, changes all the time. And by the way, they all go on to write their, their memoirs where they rip the veil from, from whatever happened in the White House and, and write bestsellers and then go on, uh, on, on TV See, for the rest of their careers. Clay, Clayton hasn't published this book yet. <laughs> so this, six, we await your book. 16 years without a breath of scandal 16 years of the most loyal staff. I, I am happy to report that I was able to penetrate that, that staff. Um, and you will see when you read the book that, um, that they did open up. But bad news, there are no scandals in the, in the Merkel uh, entourage. And um, that in itself, in the age of social media, is, is remarkable. Um, I think that that um, this this uh, uh, level of secrecy that she imposes and the level of um, 
if you if you break her trust, I mean, you know this. Um, uh, Wolfgang was was one of my really important sources for which I thank you, and I also have to thank Volker Schlendorf, who is a who is a, a friend of many many years of the Chancellor. Uh, actually, among among her first friends when when she crossed from east to west was was Volker, and and I owe both of you uh, eternal gratitude. For the many hours. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank I you. Hate secrets. <laughs> <laughs> right. And right. and but others as well in her inner circle, um, I gained their trust uh, through time, and uh, perhaps because because I'm a, a foreigner and I wasn't writing for Die Zeit uh, or Die Welt. Um, and and because I have I have to say a pretty good record for writing serious books, not you know um, uh, barn burning. <laughs> uh, so um, I I did I did I think they decided that um, that it was um, in her interest for them to um, share their views uh, of what it's like to work for this for this remarkable person who. Uh, earn their loyalty. Nobody, nobody stays with with a boss for sixteen years if they don't have if if they don't respect that boss. And so I I think that that the scandal free and the I'm I you know I, my background is in journalism. I'm the child of journalists. Um, so uh, I'm all in favor of everybody getting a, a, a scoop a day. Uh, but, but I think the greater interest uh, in in governance is is to be able to trust the people in your in your entourage, and uh, and to to have them uh, protect you, uh, particularly in the world in which we live today, where where the public's attention span is shrinking by the minute, and and a tweet can end a, a career. Uh, she didn't indulge in any social media because she very early um, spotted the danger of social media. And the only time she she went on Twitter was uh, during during her miserable four years with Donald Trump, <laughs> because that was the only way that that she could follow uh, insofar as he was thinking uh, what he was thinking. And so she would, she would, she would go on Twitter, <laughs> and but but uh, you know this this uh, this very disciplined uh, personality of hers really served the German people extremely well, and and um, I, I I have a feeling Wolfgang that um, that the, you know no no man is a prophet in his own country. We know that um, she is not deemed to be a prophet in Germany. Elsewhere, she is a revered person who is no longer considered a politician, as she is still here. Mm -hmm. She's still in office. She is considered a state. She's entered history as far as, as the rest of the world is concerned. And, and so we regard her not with the same lens sure. that that you Germans who are still uh, living under her and 16 years is a long time to be living with with uh, under anybody so I think there's fatigue here but that the admiration that the rest of the world has for her is is I think um, legitimate one final question I'm looking, yeah. does anyone Wish to raise his or her hand to ask a first question. Yeah, yeah I see over there. Mm -hmm. But 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 let me. Mm -hmm. I hope I, I'm not abusing my my role here uh, with you. Uh, just one final question comes to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, you, as somebody born in Budapest in Hungary, yes, and mm -hmm. raised by Hungarian parents, um, mm -hmm. with this Hungarian background, mm -hmm. do you think? That she was too lenient with Viktor Orban. Ah, well, Aha. okay, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. <laughs> You've hit a sore point there. Uh, I would have wished that she had been tougher with Orban. Yes, um, but I, I also because Or Orban is, a, is an outrageous uh, uh, autocrat and has and has really uh, distorted um, uh, Hungarian. Um, 
what what there was of of the sort of embryonic democracy in Hungary has has now been virtually snuffed out. Although although I, I know this isn't about Hungary, but but I'll just say this: there is now an opportunity for the opposition to to um, defeat Orban. The opposition uh, has has united for the first time. So enough about that. Um, the, the, the fact is that she is a calculating politician who weighs things very carefully. One of her mantras is the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. And, the, and, and this calculation um, is reflected in her dealings with, with Orban. She did not want to lose Hungary. She did not want another uh, loss of an EU member. She was devastated by Brexit, which she thought was a completely unnecessary and botched um, uh, election, um, and, and was unforgiving of Cameron uh, for, for having precipitated that. She did not want uh, Orban to, to exit the EU and, and, and fall into Putin's arms. As he as he would have done, so Orban is kind of small potatoes for her, and and here's the other thing that that sh that she calculates, um, German business interests, and we haven't talked about talked about Nord Stream too, but the, but there too, it's the it's the I'm it's sure the going to be a question. It's the it's the calculating it's the canny politician who weighs advantage over disadvantage. She is a she, uh, German car interests. Um, there are there are car factories, BMW factories, etc. In Hungary, that um, that she's always mindful of uh, that in her in her dealings with China. Same same calculation. Um, so she is first of all Chancellor of Germany. She is keenly aware of uh, of, of uh, German history. She's a student of, of not only German history but specifically German history. And she does not want to test Germans' reaction to, to uh, strained economic ties, because we've been there. And, and therefore, uh, all these things are, 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 um, are carefully balanced. And she's not an ideological person. She's not a, a, a dogmatic person. Um, so she's not a Kissingerian real politician. But um, but 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 she is um, yes a, a canny and calculating uh, balancer of of many interests. Or she would not have survived for sixteen years as That's as chancellor, sure. right? That's for sure. Can I see hands? Um, oh, we have a oh, lot of oh, hands. Oh, Great. Oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> Great. I think the first hand I saw go up is Josh. Is that right? Yeah. And I would. I would invite those who will now ask questions to please, if they could, briefly introduce themselves. As well? Is this yeah, working? Please, is this please working? Please stand up. Hello? Yeah, okay. so Hi, yeah. my name is Josh Hammer. I'm an author and a journalist based in Berlin. I've known Kadi for a few years uh, when you were just starting this project. So talk about calculation. What was Merkel's calculation regarding you? You tried for, I, I haven't read your book yet. I plan to very soon. Thank I you. I gather you did not get to her actually face to face. So, right? Talk, and this is a woman who was, knew that her career, political career was over, was ending. Mm -hmm. You would have thought that she, and, and you have a, if anybody could have sat down with her, it would be you. Mm. I mean, given the mm. relationship, given the connections. Mm. Um, what was her calculation in deciding to not talk to you? And you also said she did not want this book written. And well, she also gave tacit approval, obviously, to people very close to her. Yeah, it so, was. Yeah, talk about yeah that. It, was, it was kind of a. It was kind of an interesting dance uh, because certainly she had to have been aware of my many, many visits to the chancellery, and where I was talking to her very closest uh, uh, aides. And, uh, and in New York, I, I spent, a gr when I would return home to New York, the first person I would visit would, was Christoph Hoiskin, uh, Ambassador Hoiskin. Your, uh, uh, and and uh, we would go through everything I learned, and, and he, would, he would react. Uh, and give his his views. So I, I don't think that I, I ever strayed too far from from what was actually going on in the 
in the chancellery. I don't think she sees it um, in her interest to have uh, uh, to have her personal um, motivations and her personal life exposed in any way. And what this book does is um, it it it. It does that. I mean, I hope it does that because because hers is such a such a fascinating and and uh, an exemplary uh, life story. So, um, but she wasn't interested in in the, the, put it this way, Josh. Um, she didn't prevent me from doing it, and we had encounters along the way. Um, my 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 first encounter I owe to Volker Schlendorf. Who and I, I subsequently learned that this is typical of the way uh, um, the chancellor works. She um, asked Volker to arrange um, a meal, a meeting with with Richard. Uh, recently um, negotiated the peace in in Bosnia, so we had we had dinner and uh, a rather that was before she was chancellor. Right, right. She was she was uh, minister for for women and youth. But this is but but Volker. This was <laughs> so interesting that she was already thinking about her 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 future and the the possibility of uh, of, of of being um, chancellor. Uh, she wanted to hear from him and learn from him, which is how she operates. She, oh, as it happens, the fourth person at that at that meal was Susan Sontag, who of course never shut up. So, um, <laughs> so no one. No, I mean, it was a great. It was a. It was a great event, of Volker. I enjoyed it tremendously. But the chancellor did not get much of a chance to, to hear from Holbrook. And and by the way, the next day we got on on a flight, and it was the last flight to land back to New York, and it was the last flight to land before 9/11, and when the airports were were. Shot. So I, we were, we, Volker, you and I were reminiscing about this uh, earlier today. But that was so. Uh, so that was my first meeting with her, and and I do remember Richard typically chiding her for. Um, uh, Angela, uh, why are you? Um, you're minister for women and youth. You're not interested in women and youth, um, and and you know in his typical, in his typical teasing way. And and when when uh, when I first encountered her on this project, she remembered that, and 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 she said, uh, uh, you know, uh, your husband and I did not get off to a very good start, <laughs> <laughs> but she said I grew very fond of him, and and so I think that helped me. Uh, put it this way, it didn't hurt that there was this personal connection, and then I sent her. The book you referred to, uh, "Enemies of the People," um, which is which is my my own um, uh, journey in the during the Cold War as the child of political prisoners, and uh, so there was there was this. I wasn't just another American writer. I had a I had a, a, a specific history in the Cold War, and I think that may have uh, in, in enhanced my chances. But of course. I will never have a chance to ask her that because that's just not. She she doesn't deal on on that level. She just it's it, she doesn't see it in, in in her interest to open up like this. But all I can say is that that I was very lucky to have as many people who were willing to but and to be able, me, and, and to be me, able to absorb uh, observe. Let her. me make a little pitch for the book. Those of you who have not yet read the book, and I I think you should all. Read the book. You Thank will you. find that this book is extremely telling about Angela Merkel. Even if mm -hmm. you did not have the chance of spending many hours with her uh, privately, it is it very, very even for someone like myself, uh, very illuminating mm -hmm. about her political role and 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 how she behaved. Uh, in all these various settings. Can so, I just can I just say yes. thank you for saying that? Mm. Um, I didn't pay him to say that. Mm. Um, okay. And I, I, having written about um, other uh, important people, they are the least 
useful as sources. Mm. I wrote a book about presidential marriages uh, a few years ago and, and interviewed all the former presidents and first ladies. And they were incredibly boring because, <laughs> because they are totally invested in, in their own image and they have their well-polished stories and they're talking to history. The people you learn from are yeah. the people around them who tell you the real stories. So, I mean, I would have, of course, not turned down an opportunity to sit down with, <laughs> with the chancellor, but I very much doubt that I would have learned very much. If anything, uh, we'll we'll go to one question that that comes through the virtual space, and if that's okay with you, we'll take sure. two, yeah. one here, and then from the gentleman way back at the yeah. very end, Thorsten. Is this Thorsten? I can't yes, see it the is. man with the mask. It is. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So this question is a straightforward one. What trait of Merkel's leadership mm. has impressed you the most? given that you have known so many world leaders in your professional and personal mm -hmm. lives? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the first question. Torsten, what's yours? Yeah, Torsten Benner with the Global Public Policy Institute here in Berlin. Congre congratulations, Kati, on, on the you. book uh, and also the New York Times 100 list uh, today. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a question uh, in terms of what your vision and projection mm -hmm. is for Angela Merkel's post-chancellorship. Ah. What her, you know, mm -hmm. given your mm -hmm. analysis mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what do you think uh, her life, uh, her public life still has in store, given yeah. that we weren't exceedingly lucky with her, uh, her predecessor's post-chancellorship, uh, <laughs> maybe you can give yeah. us a positive vision okay. of what this could look like. Uh, okay, Thorsten, and uh, yet another uh, extremely uh, uh, useful source in my, in my uh, research. Uh, Thorsten, thank you. Um, so she will not follow the, uh, her predecessor's example uh, of, of joining a lucrative board um, in, in uh, particularly not one run from Moscow. Um, she will take, um, a, and this, this I know for a fact because I was in the chancellery the day before yesterday uh, to present a copy of my book. Um, and and um, so I have it on pretty good authority that she's planning on taking a good long vacation mm -hmm. in, in Germany um, and after that, uh, her staff would like it, and by and her staff, I'm I'm referring to two maximum three people um, would like her to actually write her own book with help from Beata Bauman. Um, I would be amazed if she did that mm. because uh, I don't think that that's in her in her nature. Um, but, but maybe Beata, who has been with her forever, um, will, uh, will prevail. And then she's going to, um, get, get, uh, engaged, um, she, she wants to actually engage in Africa and on women's rights in Africa. And, um, I think she will, because she will be free for the first time in her life, I mean, 35 years, uh, under under the ultimate uh, surveillance state, and then 16 years as chancellor. So really, um, she will taste that freedom, and with her scientists' approach, um, observe her own reaction to what it's really like not to have a schedule and not to have um, uh, uh, people uh, observing your every move. Um, and I think she will decide on her own reaction. Um, whether how deeply to re-engage, but she will have plenty of opportunities to engage. I think um, her, one of her unfinished uh, 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 projects, of course, is, is climate. And I, 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 I wouldn't be at all surprised if she, if she played a role in that. But, but she will not take any kind of an official or formal position. I mean, I was just going to ask not you a, that. Not, not you a chance. You don't see her at no. the helm of some no. No. huge, uh, hugely important international institution or organization? No, 
No, okay. I, 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 I would be amazed. I would be shocked. After you've been chancellor of Germany for 16 years, uh, what is there left for you? And, and as, as we all know, she's not interested in making tons of money because she lives in the same rent-controlled apartment. This is another quality uh, that I admire uh, in, in, in uh, the, the part of East Berlin that she is most familiar with. She's never left there. She's always done her own grocery shopping. She, it's hard to picture her on, on a yacht. Impossible, actually. Uh, she, is, she does not believe in, the, in the, any of the trappings of power. She thinks that just slows you down. These, these, you know, these are remarkable, remarkably unusual qualities for, for, uh, for a global, uh, for a powerful global figure that, that she never, she was uncorrupted by, by power. So I think we will, one thing we know about Angela Merkel, she will not be rushed. She will take her own time and, uh, and kind of observe her own reactions, but she will not lack for for options, but they, they did point out her interest in, in Africa and in women, a, African women's uh, uh, empowerment. There was, I saw a hand, uh, mm. uh, I saw a hand going up yeah, back Jeffrey. there somewhere. No, no more. Yeah, here yeah, and Helmut. there and here. Helmut first and then the lady here in the middle. Yes, yes. You're, you're number Professor two. Ross. Professor Anheyer. Uh, he has no mask on, so I can recognize him. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, stand up. Uh, Helmut Anheuer from the Hertie School. Uh, you stress that um, Angela Merkel has this non-ideological leadership yes. style, and you um, portray it in a very positive way. Yes. But could you also not have a counter-argument? Is that her leadership style turned her own party into a vacuous group? Yeah, yeah, it's you a good point. You don't know what they stand for. <laughs> yes, well, every argument has a counter-argument, and, and certainly I, I consider Merkel to be post-party politics. And, and when, um, I mean, she, she really took from everywhere. I mean, whatever worked, she would, uh, she would assume and, and go with it. I, I not being a, a, a party person myself, I, I don't consider that a handicap. I consider that extremely pragmatic, and, and it worked for her, but it certainly left the SPD flat-footed and, uh, and didn't leave the CDU um, in, in a great place either. But, but her successor uh, ran um, basically uh, as her successor. Um, and uh, so we're not, I don't think, I don't think we're going to see um, a, a dramatic uh, shift in, in policies uh, from the new chancellor, even though he's from the SPD. Um, he, he, I think, uh, is going to follow her politics, which, which were not particularly CDU-ish. So she, do, you, do you think that two years from now, a huge number of Germans will say, we want Mutti back? <laughs> I think so, but she, Mutti's not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the lady in the red, please. Yes. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Ross. Um, thank you. I'm a um, law professor and former fellow here at the Academy. Uh, I have a question about whether you think her view, the Chancellor's view of the economic dislocations in Eastern Germany mm. has changed over time. Ah, such a good question. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I, I, among her, I, I referred to, to her, her blind spots, and certainly among them was her, her impatience with her fellow East Germans' inability to, to as nimbly adapt to Western ways um, as, as fast as she did in 1989. I mean, she just went for it. Um, and, uh, and, and she was impatient with them, and she didn't spend enough time acknowledging what they had been through and their sacrifices. She's an extraordinary uh, exception to, to, uh, to, to a great many rules, and including uh, her ability at, at age, she was 36, to really become, uh, to, to reinvent herself. New career, new persona, new, you knew her in Bonn. I mean, you knew, you, you know what a, what a, what a sexist male environment that was. 
Uh, I mean, you were you were on great the, on environment. The, yeah, I was, I was about to say it was nice for you. <laughs> I was I was a young reporter in those days, uh, and I whenever I arrived to interview anybody uh, in that gray gray was the was the color of the everything, including the men's suits. Um, I, I was always asked, um, so um, when is your when is your boss arriving? Um, so I mean, I was bureau chief for ABC News, but m nobody could believe that. Um, so that was the environment. Um, uh, so she so she adapted very fast to that. She adapted by observing and and um, and and learning. Um, how to become a successful politician. But most East Germans didn't have that opportunity and, and she didn't spend enough time um, acknowledging them. And I think lately, in the last uh, few years, I think there's even a bit of nostalgia for, for her, as we all uh, slip into nostalgia with, with the passage of time. Um, she, she now is, is much more much warmer toward East Germans and um, and and understands that that it, that you know those gutted cities and the the young people who have left for jobs in the West that that really has has been demoralizing and that it isn't it's not the economy stupid it's really about needing to acknowledge people's hardships and emotional suffering and and uh, there are there there are of course millions of east germans who um who who didn't didn't do as well and that the 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 unification is incomplete to this day i mean peter schneider who's sitting behind you has written brilliantly about the incomplete uh, uh about the incomplete fusion of the two germanies and and uh she's she's a um, that that was one of her blind spots, and of course now we have the IFD, which which has found fertile uh, ground in East Germany, um, unfortunately. I and, would, and, the, would, and the anti-vaxxers yeah. are are largely in East East Germany. So all of this, but we have the same phenomenon in in the, in the United States. The people who feel like they've been left behind and not not um, sufficiently acknowledged. I would uh, personally, I would mm. think that. That's one of the sad conclusions mm -hmm. of the Merkel trajectory, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that she is now, leave, as she leaves, she leaves behind a country that is not as united as we would have loved to have it. Yeah. When you look at, the, at the, the outcome of the recent elections with uh, huge numbers for the AfD and other yeah. uh, parties in, in, the East? in East Germany. Yeah. In, and, and here is the woman from East Germany, who ran this country for 16 right. years. And these people don't feel, um, right. you know, um, uh, umarmed by her yeah, uh, yeah. or in, in, yeah, in, in included, included somehow. Yeah. Um, that's no, it's uh, true. It's, really regrettable. It, yeah, it's, um, mm. it, it, it's among her blind spots. We have a question from the lady, uh, yes, in the last row there. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Shira Brisman. I'm a professor of art history at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm a visitor here. I think you call it distinguished visitor, but oh. that's your language, not mine. <laughs> um, my question is similar to the one from my colleague on, to my left about the um, asking you to unpack something from the list of Merkel's um, uh, not maybe failures or, or not her greatest strengths. And that's something that you said about her relationship to rhetoric. You said that she's not yes. a strong rhetorician. Um, and, and certainly Machiavelli and uh -huh. Cicero before him would, would argue that rhetoric is a mm. pillar of, um, of something that's of, of, of a requirement for a person mm -hmm. of state. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering yes. what you think about the kind of future of the relationship of rhetoric and politics, mm -hmm. and whether Merkel was successful despite her weakness in this area or because of it, and, and whether you think that rhetoric is something that w will dissolve from the political global stage or whether you mm -hmm. think it has a future. Such a good question, and um, I'm afraid that Angela Merkel would not be elected to um, 
uh, county uh, 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 head of head of head of sanitation in 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 the United States. Uh, what I mean to say is that is that Germany is um, particularly um, suitable for people who have low rhetoric skills because Germany Germany was exposed to the to the danger of, of fiery rhetoric uh, in the Third Reich. And I think this is a country that is um, immune to the power of rhetoric and, and more than any other country possibly in the world. Alas, in our own country of the United States, we have not been through those fires and, and we are now experiencing them. And uh, we we um, we could we uh, Angela Merkel would not have a prayer of having a successful political career. But in Germany, it's a very specific instance of a country that where it's actually an advantage to be plain spoken, and she has turned that that deficiency. Um, and it is a deficiency in pure political terms into an advantage. And I, I don't see um, uh, future successors um, turning, turning back to the kind of rebel rousing uh, rhetoric that, that we are now increasingly uh, uh, subjected to. In, in the United States. A, so little it's more, a, it's a, a little more inspirational wouldn't hurt, though, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> yes, when, when she was once asked uh, by, by an EU official, could we have could more poetry, please, uh, Chancellor? <laughs> and, and she answered back, I'm not a poet. And, and that is an understatement. There is a, the, you quote in the book, if I remember correctly, uh, an unnamed speechwriter. Yes, yes. Who uh, said, and I quote from memory, uh, <laughs> "If I, even if I were allowed yes. to write a kind of American-style, you know, <laughs> grandiose speech, yes. she wouldn't even know how to present Deliver it." Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. No, she and she was. She had a tough time uh, with Obama in the in their early relationship uh, because she was so suspicious because he was such a brilliant speaker. And she thought that that meant that he was just a, an empty suit, um, all, all talk. But, uh, but she, cha she, cha she came around on that. Theirs, theirs was not a smooth relationship, uh, but, uh, but, 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 but after he passed uh, uh, Obamacare, she, she realized that there was more to him than, than uh, a gifted uh, speak, speaker. Kati, here is one more yeah. question from the virtual audience. Yeah. Uh, I'll read it to all of us. As much as I admired her 2015 decision to welcome those refugees, mm -hmm. what has followed in terms of German and European asylum and migration policies and actions is absolutely shameful. How would you explain this dire state of affairs? <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I cannot disagree. Mm -hmm. it, it is shameful. And, and when, when she allowed a million uh, Middle Eastern refugees to come in, she fully expected that her fellow EU members would step up. But they didn't. And you and I saw this in the Balkans when, when the... Um, uh, it was the, uh, uh, the foreign minister of Luxembourg who said the hour of Europe has dawned. Do you remember? Oh, yes, indeed. Um, and yeah. the hour of Europe did not dawn. It took an American um, to, um, yeah. frankly, uh, the EU has, has, uh, has, has uh, deficiencies, which she's not a miracle worker. She could, she could not... Uh, pull the EU together on, on migration, and it still hasn't happened. And, and I was very happy that you highlighted uh, that, that the Balkans are on, that Bosnia is again on the brink. And, um, you know, when, when, when will we ever learn uh, here in Europe? I'm, I'm half European. Um, I don't know. Um, we have to give her credit, by the way, just, yeah. to, re to, yeah. just to add that to the, to the Balkan argument. We have to give her credit 
for single-handedly having decided a few years ago to uh, uh, to create something which has now been called the Berlin Process, yes. where each year the leaders of the Balkans meet with major European leaders. It, that was a valiant effort, in, mm. in my view, to at least make sure that these issues are not totally forgotten. Yeah, uh, that they remain somehow on the on, on the international on the Brussels radar screen, etc. But I'm afraid we're at a at a yeah. uh, inf possible inflection point mm. Mm. Uh, as mm. far as Balkan peace is concerned. Yeah. We have and about then, uh, we have about five or ten minutes. Mm. Um, so. Mm. Mm. Eckhart von Kleden and then the gentleman uh, and, and then Ben, uh, Dan, excuse me, um, Ecky. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang. Um, one question, one little anecdote, uh, yeah. Katie, to underline what you, I think, have also written in your book, what I uh, unfortunately ha have not the privilege to read uh, so far. Mm. Um, first, the question, what would you say was under her leadership the best and the worst uh, single decision? And, uh, <laughs> and I should probably be asking you. you I, I have mine, but uh, yes, okay. first of all, I would like to. Should I say mine? Yes, please do. I think the yes. best was keeping Greece in the euro. Yes, yes. And the worst was giving up conscription. Oh, interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, that, but I, this is my... Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that's so interesting. So keeping Greece in the euro, yeah, we, we, we did, there are many, many issues we didn't get around to. But, um, but I, I agree with you on that. And, and that, that whole process, which I do deal with <laughs> at, at some length, um, really revealed uh, both her strengths and her weaknesses. The, the, the weakness was that that she was she was very dogmatic in preaching austerity to the southern rim and to Greece particularly during the eurozone uh, crisis. But uh, but ultimately, she was right, and and uh, and she did she 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 was was demonized in Greece, as you know, burnt in effigy and so on. Um, but it turned out to be um, it, it turned out to be the correct uh, yeah. policy uh, on, con on conscription. <coughs> tell us why. Um. I think that the uh, shape of the Bundeswehr now is uh, one reason why the Bundeswehr is in such a bad shape mm -hmm. is that we gave uh, conscri uh, up conscription. You, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think in Germany, mm -hmm. you, uh, the leaders you need mm -hmm. uh, in an army. Uh, often uh, don't come with the wish to become uh, a professional soldier. And this connection between the society mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the army is, is uh, very, very useful. And uh, yeah. I think we have uh, lost this now. Mm. Yeah, this is not her strength. She never gave a single speech on, uh, on the need for, uh, to, to strengthen the, the armed forces. This is just not in her yeah. kultur. Um, and you can you can well understand why why it wouldn't be. Of course. And we haven't we haven't spoken enough, uh, Wolfgang, about her Lutheran faith and the importance of that, and and her her uh, formation as the pastor's daughter, which is as important as as her um, East German. Uh, as, I, I think the two pillars of who she is are are her deeply held. Um, uh, Lutheran values, which she imbibed from her father, the pastor, um, and 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 the other, of course, is 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 living in a in a state without freedom. So for her, freedom is not an abstraction, and I think that that it makes her probably unique among all the heads of state. Is that is that she had experienced the to the absence of freedom, and and which is why when when Putin. Uh, sends his his military into uh, into um, a, a foreign country. She immediately reacts in a way that no one else really did. Uh, not even not even Washington. So this is something visceral for her: the absence of freedom, um, and and that will will be missing from from the conference of powerful leaders. Uh, someone with her her particular uh, background. Of no, of no freedom. Okay. And the anecdote, maybe? Yes, yes please. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's about confidentiality, mm -hmm. uh, what you also have mentioned. I have the privilege to join for four years uh, the morning situation with her. And uh, it was really impressive, uh, it's still impressive, I think, 
how attentive and mindful she's reading articles. Yeah. And it quite often ended with that she handed to over, handed over to one uh, attendant, uh, one participant of this um, uh, group, one article with a detail and asked mm. him, uh, what uh, is this? Is this correct? And please report tomorrow uh, 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 what you find out about it. And here's the anecdote. Many journalists um, tried to uh, find out who was attending this uh, group. Mm -hmm. And no one was right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes someone was missing, someone mm -hmm. uh, was in that was not joining. No journalist so far. Robin, I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, uh, because uh, you wrote uh, uh, about a different period. But uh, mm. uh, in the years 2009 till 2013, many journalists tried it. And it was always a lot of fun <laughs> in, the, in yeah. that uh, morning situation, finding out that always, yeah. again, yeah. a journalist failed to find out who uh, is attending. Yes. Mm. <laughs> that's it. That's Thank great. you. The, the gentleman yeah. in the back, there at the, at the door. Hi, thanks, Katya. I'm Bertrand Ross. I'm a law professor and a fellow here. Um, I wanted to talk about the book as a blueprint for leadership. Mm. And the leadership you describe has unfortunately been very gendered. Those yes. leadership qualities have been associated with what women do, not with what men do. Women are, are, don't sort of put themselves and their ego at the center of kind of leadership or, mm -hmm. or maybe be more, more results oriented. And I wanted to think, wanted to um, ask you about how well, or how do we get that blueprint for leadership to cross the gender divide hmm. based on her experiences with other leaders during her chancellorship? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did, mm -hmm. Were there stories or accounts of how leaders might have been influenced by yeah. the way she approached leadership mm -hmm. in ways mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. you know, maybe pose hope for the future? <laughs> I wish I could. It's such a good question. But, it, it, you know, it's uh, unfortunately um, we're, we're dealing with a, a generation of men who are beyond repair, frankly. <laughs> uh, it will take... Uh, it will take the next generation. I'm happy to report that my son, for example, is, is already of a different mentality where, where it's, you know, he, he's just given himself four months of paternity leave um, with his newborn, which is considered absolutely normal. That's just an illustration. Um, uh, my husband didn't, uh, didn't miss doing the news the night when, when uh, my children were born. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, this, these are deep, uh, deep cultural, uh, ha uh, I mean, you know this, these, 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 these are the hardest things you, uh, to transform and, and they uh, cannot be legislated. Uh, we women have to um, do a better job of saying, this is not acceptable any longer, this kind of uh, behavior. And I think maybe COVID has played a role in this because we've all been locked up at home and, and, uh, and, and, and most, I, I don't want to sound like a total sexist, but I think most men uh, encountered um, home life <laughs> for the first time, you know, with kids and, and no office to escape to. And so you, maybe that will. You may not have seen the comic that I yeah. saw somewhere in the, in the German paper where this little girl asks her mother, Mom, is it true that a man can be chancellor? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. there has been yeah. change. So in, in, Germany. Germany, in Germany, there's hope. <laughs> but in our country, uh, we, haven't, we haven't broken that glass ceiling. I mean, Hillary came close, but... Mm, uh, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't see the next, the next. So we, you know, we, 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 we have to, we, we have to read this book for starters. <laughs> and read we the have book. To learn, yes, and we have to learn from, from her, from her example. Um, then. Uh, wait, we have uh, Peter Schneider has a question. Oh, uh, Peter. Yeah. Uh, take, oh, yeah. Pe take off your mask. For Peter gets the last question. Yeah. Okay. And then yeah, there's one uh, decision of Angela Merkel which um, still um, 
is really bothering me or yeah. I mean her greatest decision was to put her arms around all these refugees right. and say yes you can come we will take you mm. this is an emergency in Vienna and in Budapest and if everyone says no I say yes mm -hmm. it was one of the greatest gestures in her whole policy life yes there's no question about this But then, I think, what she missed doing was, mm -hmm. here are the rules. There were, there were no rules when, when she opened up. Mm -hmm. She never made a speech saying, mm -hmm. of course we cannot take everyone who wants to come to us. We want to welcome everyone, but simply we cannot do this. There is a limit. Mm -hmm. How do we treat this question about the limit, mm -hmm. the famous Obergrenze? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you believe that for one year, all the big parties in Germany, under her rule, SPD, the Greens, the Linke, and the CDU, there was one word that was almost fascist mm -hmm. in his... This was the word Obergrenze. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I mean, this is uh, uh, this lack of giving rules. How mm -hmm. do, do we treat mm -hmm. this? Mm -hmm. What are mm -hmm. the true lessons of our past? Yeah. Uh, and where is the limit? How do we treat this limit? Mm -hmm. Has also, uh, of course, has um, has not given courage to the other Europeans to deal with our way of dealing with refugees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have no solution to it. By the way. There is no real solution to the question I'm asking. But she should have tried, and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. we still mm -hmm. should try. We, we, we must. Uh, yeah. I say we, we, we should take everyone who comes from Syria. I would like to take everyone who wants to come from Belarus. But of course we cannot take uh, every, everyone who, who wants to come, and, uh, and we, make, we have to yeah. have rules that are valid also for other countries. Uh, The United States is not a free wheeling country that takes everyone who wants to come. The same is true for Canada and Austria. Australia. Yeah. No, I, 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 I take I take your point, and and I again I repeat um, that she is not a perfect politician. She's not a perfect human being. There is no such thing. Um, but uh, but her her um, her her values and her heart were in the right place um, and uh, but she she made mistakes but the initial the initial decision was was the the morally correct one and she was entirely alone in that decision that's true um, so you know we can we can quibble over the details of of the decision and the lack of infrastructure and the lack of preparedness we you know all of that is legitimate but but the 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 principle behind it uh, was uh, remarkable and and changed germany's um, self perception and the perception of the war, the rest of the world for now germany. we need the microphone for dan dan gets the last word please and then i get it again but, oh uh, okay <laughs> no, but this is a question so um First of all, a, a comment and then a question. I, I would contend that actually the person whose leadership style in terms of not having ego involved, who's most like Angela Merkel, was Obama, who it was always no drama Obama. He was a great, he was a great orator, as we all know, but he was also incredibly detached, and I think that was a big part of why they admired each other. So Bertrand, there is hope there, that, that some, that some male leaders may at some point get it right again. Um, question for you, though. Um, for an American reading the German press, and I think this was true of uh, many of our journalistic colleagues uh, abroad, the astonishing thing about Merkel's last six months was how vituperatively she was attacked by the German press. Mm -hmm. She's mm -hmm. going out the door and look at everything she hadn't done. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. 16 years in power, where are we on digitalization? Where are mm -hmm. we on the EU? Mm -hmm. Where are we on infrastructure? Where are we mm -hmm. on all these things? And it was, you know, for someone who has an American 
I think, a mainstream American view of her as a remarkable leader who yeah. saved the day for so much. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, it, was, it was shocking, shocking. to watch. And I'm yeah. curious, since you, know, you do a biography of a leader, you're doing a biography of a country as well. Um, mm -hmm. How do you explain this? And do you think that these charges will have legs? Um, so uh, I, I, I return to my, my original uh, statement that, that no man or woman is a prophet in his or her own country. And uh, she, she is not, she's not the exception. Um, I think that, that her, uh, her, her, her global stature um, will, um, uh, will be permanent and, um, and, and, and that she has a, a role to play in, in the world beyond German politics. German politics and the, and the press that covers German politics um, can be very petty, and uh, and they are bored. Covering her for 16 years was no picnic. Um, you know, very few stories were broken, as we've already said. I mean, it's uh, uh, deeply frustrating to <laughs> to uh, cover um, uh, such a uh, politician who never, you know, who never, never, uh, never a scandal, never, never a, an interesting. Personal story, uh, so there, so there's frustration in that regard, and uh, and and frankly, one of her strengths is that she doesn't give a damn. Her, she is the most inner directed um, leader that I have ever encountered. Her ultimate test is her own test for herself, um, and I think she leaves office with a sense of having uh, performed her duty, which is enormously important to her, again, going back to the pastor's daughter uh, formation. Um, I think that, that she leaves with, with, a, with a, 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 a very clean conscience that she did her damnedest. She stayed at the table when there was a, you know, a, a shred of possibility of reaching an agreement. She was there. Uh, she never, unlike Obama, I, I, I uh, could take you on about Obama's lack of ego. Uh, um, Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, unlike Obama, who, who refused to deal with Putin because he, he said, she, he does nothing but lie to me. Well, he did nothing but lie to her too, but she did not have the luxury of, uh, of saying somebody else negotiate with him. Obama did. Obama said, you carry the ball, uh, Angela, during the Ukraine crisis. She could not walk away. Um, so um, I, I, I think that, that her, she's, the ultimate, she's the ultimate judge of her own performance, and I think she, she's giving herself pretty high marks for having done her best.